Hello everyone that cares. Um, welcome back. Actually, I should tell myself welcome back just to your YouTube channel. I haven't been posting regular content as you guys have all noticed because I did start my PhD and to be honest, YouTube isn't a priority for me in this moment. However, <coughs> uh, however, in this last month or two, I was thinking whether I should continue YouTube or not. And I came to the conclusion that I will document my sensor creation process because I want to contribute to the open sourced hardware community. And I think it's really important to share science this way and also to get people excited about science and show the struggles and also, yeah, show the daily struggles because this PhD and this sensor creation is not going to be easy. So I think that's really important. Um, however, other types of content will not be a priority of mine. So that's what I wanted to say. So everyone else watching that just clicked on this video and has no idea what I'm talking about, I'm Jess and I just started my PhD two months ago. A little context about what it is. I am going to be, I'm a mechanical engineer, now working, doing a, a PhD in the environmental engineering department in a university in Switzerland called ETH. And um, what is this PhD about? Just so you have context for this next vlog. The PhD is about um, investigating sediment um, and turbidity. How is turbidity and sedi how is sediment um, in a basin, a river catchment? As it travels along the river, how is it connected and disconnected to the sources in the river? So maybe that's agricultural land, um, like a farm or the city or water coming, like groundwater. So all of these different sources and sinks of sediment. And then also um, how do the tributaries in this river connect? And so that's my project. Um, in order to answer these types of questions, we have to come up with different creative solutions to... Um, yeah, to answer these questions, because so far people aren't really looking at this question at a high spatial resolution with satellite imagery, yes. However, it is quite difficult to do this type of analysis, um, high spatial and high temporal resolution analysis um, for smaller rivers. And um, yeah, so that's my project. How will I achieve this project? And why will I achieve it? And why hasn't anyone else done it? So my plan is to build a turbidity sensor. Mm -hmm. And that is crazy because <laughs> it's really difficult. <laughs> um, I have quinoa in my teeth. <laughs> Sorry about that. Apparently that's really crazy. So what I wanted to do today was just walk you through my home office. Um, I hope everyone is staying home in these corona times. And then tell you what I've been doing the last two months, where I'm at right now, the problems I'm facing, um, etc, etc. So what have I been doing in the past few months? So this concept of creating a cheap turbidity sensor isn't new. Many people have tried to do it and many people are doing it and the technology is constantly evolving in terms of, you know, open source hardware and cheap versions of this sensor because if you don't know, normally these sensors cost anywhere from four to 10,000 euros. Um, so if you're interested, you know, I'll link some papers below. I'm not sure if they're open access or not. So maybe you might need to um, have a university subscription in order to access some of these papers. Um, but just for the concept, uh, I've been reading a lot of these papers in the last two months trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to do this because I tested out one of these cheap sensors and also another paper tested them out so I really didn't have to go so much into detail in figuring out if this um, cheap version will work 
but this is a cheap uh, dishwasher version of this sensor. And my original plan was to use one of these things and make this sensor, but it's definitely not accurate enough. If you watch one of my videos that will be here or here, you can see that it's a terrible piece of uh, electronic equipment. And then also there's this paper here that also tested it in a lab setting and it's just complete trash. So then I was thinking, okay, I need to create my own actual um, sensor. <laughs> so here we are. So this is what I've been doing in the last few months, reading papers, trying to design um, the sensor that I'm going to create. So the sensor is going to have a lot of different components, right? It's going to have the actual turbidity sensing technology, which we'll get into. It's going to have like a real-time clock so that the sensor saves batteries, so it goes to sleep and then the clock every 15 minutes wakes it up, takes a measurement and then puts the sensor back to sleep so it could be left in the field. It's going to have like um, LoRa, which is I think uh, low radio, low radio, LoRa, I think low Mm, frequency radio signal so that um, I can send each measurement every time it's taken to a receiver which the plan is also to create and then the receiver will then upload the data um, from uh, from the sensor it will take this data it will receive it wait so then the receiver will upload the data to like a Google spreadsheet or something so that I can constantly monitor um, the data entries and make sure that the sensor is still in its location, it's still, there's no all of a sudden crazy peaks, um, and it's still in the water and it's still taking measurements, you know, and it's still working and the battery isn't dead. So the first thing out of all of those different components that I wanted to tackle is the actual turbidity technology because there's no point of moving on to, you know, um, printing a circuit board or figuring out which microcontroller to use or starting to program the real-time clock or connecting any of these things if I don't have working technology. And this is not working technology. So now I will explain to you the principle behind a turbidity sensor. So as I was saying, I'm sure there are many different versions of or ways to measure turbidity. So first I'll explain to you what turbidity is. Turbidity is basically um, how cloudy water is. So clear bottled water has almost no turbidity or zero turbidity compared to milk, which is extremely turbid because it's very cloudy. So how do you measure turbidity? Basically, let's say you have a water sample and it has particles in it. Can you see that? water samples with particles in it. What you're gonna do is if you shine a, a light or a laser into this particle sample, what's gonna happen is that these particles are then gonna scatter the light, okay? And so the basic principle of these turbidity sensors is that you have a light source here. So let's say that's like the LED. This is supposed to be an LED. And then here you have some detectors. So let's say this is a detector, and let's say this is a detector. Okay, and so these detectors are viewing how much light is being scattered in these viewing angles. So that's a principle before, uh, about the um, turbidity sensor and they all have different architectures and I'll place them here um, so for example you can have one that just has this 90 degree angle that's called a nephilometric turbidity sensor you can have ones that have multiple detectors so one at 90 degrees one at 180 degrees one at 45 degrees one at 135 degrees there's there's just a lot of different um, cases or versions of this um, technology, okay? So what I decided to do is I decided to do um, an LED, not a laser because I needed to work in the field, I needed to be low power and I needed to work for a long time, and two detectors. 
one is at 90 degrees and one is either directly across from the LED or it's at 135 degrees. So I'm gonna test both architectures. You know, now that I wanna build the thing, I, I go online and I start looking at different components to buy and LEDs all come in different wavelengths. Um, detectors all detect a range of different wavelengths. They all have different power requirements. They all... <sighs> There's a lot of different things to consider. I mean, let me show you. So for example, I've been trying to buy my electronics on this website called DigiKey. I know I could just be a... Uh like recording my screen but I'm way too lazy. So here I typed in IR LEDs and you have infrared UV visible emitters <sighs> and here you have you, you know your current, your forward current, different ratings, here you have your radiant intensity, the wavelength, the forward voltage, the viewing angle and then there's uh, 161 pages and you have I had to go through you know all of these different things and decide well I don't know I how am I supposed to know which one of these is the is the best one? How am I gonna know which I don't know which I mean I know I want to test out IR, but if I want to test out an IR light, um, I need an IR detector and an IR detector for cheap is not so easy to find. So then I'm like, okay, well maybe if it doesn't work out with the IR detector, then I should look up uh, an ambient light and then if I look up an uh, if I find an ambient light, then I need to find an ambient light detector. So this was kind of the thought process that I've been going through and it took me a few weeks to decide all of the different components that I'm gonna buy, like the resistors and the capacitors and what needs to be hooked up and, you know, I'm not gonna start soldering everything like I did in this last video. <laughs> I need to prototype and test all the components and see what works how. Um, I opted for an IR LED with a narrow viewing angle. And then I also opted for an IR um, detector, but the IR detector still detects quite a bit of visible light. So then I also ordered these um, uh, low pass filter glasses that are going to like low pass, low pass glass filters that will pass any light above 750. Um, nanometers, which is great because my LED is 850 nanometers. Why did I decide to go for an IR um, LED? Because, um, you know, my sensor is going to be in water and it's going to be shielded as much as possible from ambient light. However, you know, you have to start thinking of these engineering problems. Um, I'm gonna try to create like a black box sort of for the sensor, but if water is gonna mix into this tube or whatever, so if I have the sensor up here and if water is gonna mix into the tube, you know, light is gonna, there's gonna be light shining up into the tube. It's just inevitable because the river is reflecting light and it's bright outside. <laughs> so, um, if I have an ambient light and an ambient detector, then it's definitely going to be detecting the light the from the atmosphere, from, you know, from the outside. Uh, sunlight also emits IR, but IR um, takes some time and is absorbed in water. And I figured I might as well use an IR LED, an IR detector, and then this way I can eliminate as much stray light as possible. There will still be some stray IR light from the sun, but I'm hoping, you know, it'll be a minimum. Do I know if it's gonna work? No. And that's where I take you to my next step, which is how I'm gonna test everything. So I have, an, so far what I ordered, like IR LED, ambient light LED, IR detector, ambient light detector, and then filters, low pass filters. So here, for example, is how I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna have to 3D print or make this kind of testing chamber. And I'm gonna have many different versions. I'm gonna have, the first test will be, I got these little um, Plano convex lenses, which I can actually show you right here, if I can do this with one hand. Oh, they're so pretty. So I got these Plano convex lenses and obviously when you have an IR LED, even though it has a 
emitting angle of only 10 degrees, it's still going to, um, like in this chamber, it's still going to spread quite a bit. And the detector is also going to have a large viewing angle. And so to emit stray light or even in this case, so for example, if I have the LED projecting light here, I don't want this uh, sense this detector to here it's not focusing. I don't want this detector to detect, you know, all of this light and all of this light. I want it to detect the light that's scattered towards it. And I want this detector not to detect the scattered light. I want it to detect the light transmitting through. So I want all of these detectors to have a very narrow viewing angle. And I want the light to also emit a narrow um, pulse, I guess, so it's more of like a laser. So first test I'm gonna do, LED versus the detector. Um, I didn't draw the third detector, but it's supposed to be like this. So uh, just plain LED versus the detector. This is just some sort of glass so that the water doesn't pour in and ruin my detector. Next test, how does, it, how does the same configuration work with these two plano convex lenses? Do you get higher accuracy? Next test, do you get higher accuracy when there is stray light with these um, low pass filters? Next test which architecture gives you more, um, what, what's it called? Yeah, higher accuracy. Once all those tests are done, they will be done for like dark, bright conditions and then shaded conditions um, because I'm assuming this isn't gonna be completely dark but it will also be, you know, hopefully somewhat shaded. Then when all of that is done, repeat the experiment with the ambient light detector and see if you get, if I get, you know, just as accurate or maybe higher accuracy, don't know. So next thing that I'm doing right now is trying to figure out how to build this test chamber. Um, so I kind of came up with like some sketches of how I'm gonna do this and I've created the AutoCAD and I can show you that next. So to be honest, I'm already bored of hearing myself talk and I need to take a break. I think I'm gonna read and then I think, I mean, it's Good Friday today. I think I will revisit this with you on Monday. I spend every single day thinking about this and throughout the week I don't wanna talk about it and then now on the weekends I don't wanna do it either. Um, so what I will hopefully do before I see you on Monday is put up a shelf up there, which I've been meaning to put up for a while. And then, um, yeah, try to do some at-home workout because we need to stay healthy in these corona times. As part of my break, I finally decided to put up this stupid shelf, which I've been avoiding because I was always just thinking, ah, I'll just put that up on a day where I really have nothing else to do. And then to this day, I actually had to film this video and I was just procrastinating, so I finally decided to put up the shelf. Yeah, that's just sometimes how life works. And then, this is actually a funny story, I tried to cover up some holes, so I got this white paint. Turns out the white paint wasn't the right color, so I had these splotches, but I turned them into these nice plants. And then for Easter, I decided to make my grandma's famous galupzi, and here are some photos. They're stuffed cabbages, so good. So it's an entire week later, Rewatching the footage, I noticed the entire time I had something in my teeth and nobody told me. That's number one. Number two, I also noticed I'm wearing the exact same thing. <laughs> um, that is not on purpose. Uh, it is definitely another day. It's a week later. It was Easter last weekend and I was too lazy to continue filming. So now I'm going to show you my next steps in the project. So number one is sending off this piece of CAD whatever in order to get it made so that I can test all of my components. So I'm going to show you what I made uh, in my SolidWorks whatever CAD software. So I'm not going to record my screen because I am way too lazy to edit this kind of um, footage. So this is what I made. So 
Mm, basically, yeah, let me change this like this. So it has a solid bottom. Um, and here, it, let me change it back to wireframe. So you can see the LED will be pushed in on this side and epoxied and from the inside, um, this little part right here is going to have the plano convex lens. Similarly, on these two, this is where the detectors will go. So the plano convex lens will be pushed into this piece right here from the inside. And then from the outside, I'll push in the, um, the filter, the glass filter. And then I'm about to make like a little cap that will fit on um, easily something like this where I can put the detector into it and then take the detector and put it, uh, so take the detector and just push it up against this and take it out and then that way I can easily put in and out all of the different configurations, um, try the different detectors, etc, etc. So this is going to be 3D printed. On top I'm just going to glue one of these pieces. Um, so that I don't waste 3D printing material. And then I'm going to have this long tube and inside I'm going to pour the different um, NTU solutions. So the different solutions with different uh, turbidity values. And then in order to compare all of my turbidity values actually in the mail, what arrived is a real turbidity meter. One that costs something like uh, it's 2000 and it's the cheapest on the market. So if I open it up, I can show you what's, what? How do I open this? So here, it's just a very simple sewn. You just put it in the water to measure turbidity and um, there's no screen or anything. It's a Bluetooth module that you have to connect to an Android app. So this is the cheapest one on the market, 2000 francs. Um, I went and uh, this weekend and I tested it in the Seal and the Limat, those are two rivers in Zurich, and seems to work. So why do I need one of these? If I have like a solution of, so there are different standard solutions which are called like, um, um, it's something, it's some chemical called Formazine and you can buy it at a turbidity value of 4000 and then dilute it and get like 150, 500, 1000, 4000 NTU solutions. And then I know that this solution is, you know, 4000, but I don't know, like, if I diluted the 4000 enough to be exactly 1000, maybe it's 1010. And in order to measure that, I need uh, an expensive sensor so that I know what my cheap sensor is supposed to be, which value my cheap sensor is supposed to get. Um, but also Formazine is super, uh, dangerous and carcinogenic, so I'm not actually allowed to have it in my apartment. So instead I'm going to use like apple juice and milk and measure its turbidity with this thing. Maybe the milk is like 536, but then I know that that's what my turbidity, my cheap device should be measuring. I also noticed I never shared my home office setup, so this is me. Here are my, this is my working desk. Um, I'm editing, so I noticed I didn't even show you guys my working desk. I put my aloe down here because it got sunburnt because my window has way too much sunlight. So this is my working, my workstation. I have a grounded uh, anti-static mat. I have a bunch of papers just glued. I have a lot of beautiful things that make me happy up here. I guess this kind of also makes me happy. So yeah, I have all of my, uh, you know, sketches, designs, information about different components here. Here, I have a bunch of different parts. I have some Arduinos for prototyping. I have a bunch of connectors. This is an anti-static, like, grounding wristband. Um, and then I have a bunch of my components here, also in anti-static bags. Um, here you can see, yeah, I already set up some capacitors and detectors. 
Actually, the detector isn't there. It's here, just out in the open. Very good. Yeah, so this is my workstation at home. Um, something I didn't mention, this desk, <laughs> it's just like a piece of wood, two pieces of wood propped up. It's actually sitting on my other desk here. So it's completely like, it's not very stable, so not very good for working with optics. And that's exactly why I'm 3D printing this piece here. Because aligning these pieces perfectly is already going to be a challenge. And then especially living on the fourth floor with a table that's not stable and on the fourth floor and they're doing construction downstairs, like the whole apartment is moving all the time. So in order to properly do this experiment and prototype and test these components, I really need to just create something that will hold all of my components together and I can trust it. And well, I mean, we'll see. So that's what's up for this week. I will try to be better at like vlogging when I'm actually working, but so far it hasn't really been interesting experiments or anything. Um, when I start the experiments, I will vlog them, I will record them, and I will upload them, so you will see them in the next vlog, which will be, I don't know when. But if you're here and enjoying this, thank you for, um, yeah, being interested in my work, and I hope I don't disappoint you with how infrequently I post. Um, it's just, yeah, I, it's not that I don't like participating in like YouTube community, but my priority right now has changed to this PhD and I hope that's okay and I will still try to post as much as I physically can. So thank you very much for watching and yeah, of course, if you like it, like, below, subscribe, comment if you have questions. Thank you.